is also a PhD student at our lab, and Mustafa, who will be here in a second, is from Israel. <laughs> so, the workshop is scheduled in two parts. We have one part where we'll talk about cross-chain communication, the principle. We'll also explain why cross-chain communication is or is not possible without a trusted third party. And then we'll also have a technical deep dive into chain relay, specifically BDC relay. And then we've prepared a game. So essentially, if you have Ganache installed on your laptop, if not, you should download it now. Um, you will get a broken BDC relay implementation and you get to fix small parts of it. And we'll have a game server which tests attacks against your relay and then we'll have a leaderboard. So, um, this workshop is based on a paper we recently released. So we wrote up a systematization of knowledge on cross-chain communication. So it's on ePrint if you want to have a look at that. I won't be presenting everything because it's just way too much content. Um, but yeah, if you're interested, that's where you should look. So, I mean, I guess we can all agree on why interoperability is necessary, but let me just repeat this again. Um, today there exist over 2,000 cryptocurrencies, and I think we can agree that most of them differ in design and purpose, not only from functionality, but also the different views of the community of how this thing should be used. So we kind of need a way to find a path to communicate between these different blockchains because it's very unlikely that it'll be one chain to rule them all. Now, historically seen, cross-chain communication, the principles of cross-chain communication date back to communications across distributed databases. However, the main difference here is that in databases, specifically within a, within a single data center, you don't expect bits and dean or adversarial behavior, right? You assume that everyone's honest, you have a single admin, and the only thing that can happen to your processes which push and pull data from the databases, they can crash. So basically non-blocking non atomic commits is a way, there's a, basically as a problem and there's solutions for that. And the problem is that you want to make sure that your process that is running correctly does not fail and does not get stuck even if other processes crashed. Now, in distributed ledgers and blockchain specifically, the difference is that we actually expect participants to misbehave, right? We can have selfish miners, we can have people who try to double spend and just attack the protocol because anyone can join the system. And this is basically the major difference between these two things. So, if we briefly talk about the main scenarios of cross-chain computer, if we talk about the main scenarios of cross-chain communication, I guess the one that everyone knows about is exchange of assets, right? Swapping coins against each other and also trying to transfer coins from one chain to the other, right? Making a payment to a merchant who maybe only accepts Ethereum and you're only in Bitcoin. Now, there we have atomic swaps. We also have the concept of cryptocurrency backed assets. We'll talk about this too in more detail later. Now, another very important thing or scenario where cross-chain communication occurs is synchronization in sharded systems. Specifically, the idea of sharding is that you separate the state of a system and each shard is responsible to, make, to maintain and secure the state or a subset of the state. Now the problem is, this only makes sense if you can actually communicate between these shards because otherwise you have a system of isolated shards and then it's a re-shard. So we'll talk about the differences and the different use cases and assumptions between sharding and cross-chain transfers a bit later. Now, what I think not many people know is that cross-chain communication was actually um, the first time implemented to use something else. Specifically, it was used to introduce merge mining. And that's basically a bootstrapping technique to launch new blockchains. And the idea there is that you have one parent chain and you allow miners to reuse the proof of work solutions from the parent chain, for example, Bitcoin, to create blocks and other blockchains like Namecoin. And essentially there, that means that Namecoin can use the security assumptions of Bitcoin but it also becomes dependent because if Bitcoin fails, so does Namecoin because it uses the same proof of work basically. And finally, and this is, we try to cover this a bit more in the paper, um, there is this term of sidechains. Now, sidechains have seen many, many different definitions over the, over the years and it's become an umbrella term for blockchain interoperability in general. And I guess the most famous two that we have seen is sidechains are an approach to extend functionality of a one blockchain which becomes a parent chain and you have small blockchains on the side which are dependent on the security model of the parent chain. But there are other definitions, and also quite famous ones, specifically in academia, which suggest that sidechains basically refer to one blockchain verifying the state of the other. Now in the paper we we'll try to clarify this, and we try not to use this term at all because it's very confusing to check. So again, we'll talk about these two things in more, in more detail today. 
Now, maybe a question to the audience. How many of you think that cross-chain communication is possible in a trustless manner? Okay, maybe you've seen our tweet before. Okay, so the answer is no. And I'll try to explain why this is the case. But before being, a, being academics, you know, before we explain something, we always have to make a system model. You know, to be sure that we cover all cases and that we understand what we're talking about. So in cross-chain communication, we, for simplicity, assume that we have two different ledgers, right? In this case, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, we also have two parties or processes as in distributed systems. We have Alice on Bitcoin and Bob on Ethereum. Now, now let's assume we have two transactions, right? Transaction one, the blue one, is owned by Alice, so only she can push it to the blockchain. And transaction two is owned by Bob. Now, transaction one is a Bitcoin transaction. It can only go into the Bitcoin blockchain. Transaction two is valid on Ethereum. It can only go into Ethereum. So far, so clear, right? Fairly simple. Now, the idea of cross-chain communication is that Alice wants that Bob writes transaction two to Ethereum, and Bob would like that Alice write transaction one to Bitcoin. Now this, and basically this also implies that Alice knows exactly how transaction two looks like, and the other way around, Bob knows what he actually wants to have. Now, if we want to reduce this to practice, you can imagine this being an exchange, right? Transaction two gives Ethereum to Alice, transaction one gives Bitcoin to Bob, right? And let's keep this in mind for the rest of the discussion. Now, the goal of cross-chain communication is to synchronize these two processes, right? We want to make sure that Alice writes transaction one to Bitcoin, but Bob also writes transaction two to Ethereum. And we actually want to ensure that they both write at the same time, or at least atomically. Now, we have three properties for cross-chain communication in the paper. I will not bore you with the theoretical definitions here. I'll just try to give the intuition what each of, what each of them means. So effectiveness basically states that if everything is all right, if Alice and Bob are honest, and the transactions are as they expect, then cross-chain communication will proceed correctly, right? So this basically allows the whole process to be executed. Now, atomicity reduces the set of potential behaviors to ensure that either Alice and Bob write transactions to the respective blockchains, so either TX1 goes into Bitcoin and TX2 goes into Ethereum, or none of them do, right? Because otherwise, Alice or Bob could be at a disadvantage, and this would break our goal. And finally, timeliness basically ensures that at some point the protocol proceeds. At some point, Bob or Alice will initiate the process and then the protocol starts working. Now, let's recall again, we're looking at an exchange. And essentially, cross-chain communication between Alice and Bob can be seen as a fair exchange of assets. Specifically using our example to emphasize this. Right, because they want to make sure that Alice receives coins on, Bit uh, on Ethereum and Bob receives coins on Bitcoin atomically. Otherwise, one of them would be cheap. Now, the thing is that fair exchange is impossible without a trusted third party. And this is a result from back, dating back to 1999. Um, if, you have an, if you want to have a look, it's written in this paper. It's actually fairly easy to follow. And there's a really good explanation also about discussion about trusted third par parties and what this actually means. Well, questions? Yeah. What do you consider trustless? Sure. Let's get back to the app. This is, I will talk about it in a second. But because using national block contracts is possible. No. <laughs> and I'll try to explain in a second. Because well, then the question is what you consider transfers. <laughs> <laughs> the definition before. So, I'll explain in a second. You will get to that point. But yeah, HTLCs allow you to reduce trust in the third party, but you don't have a guarantee that, you're to, that the exchange will actually be atomic. We'll get to that in a second. So again, we conjecture right, right now that it's impossible, right? And there's a whole, basically a proof sketch in the paper, and I'll try to give an intuition here right now because obviously I don't think you should just trust me by me saying it. <laughs> so let's assume again, we have a smart contract in Ethereum, right? And the smart contract allows us to do way more things than just HTLC right? So it kind of supersedes HTML contracts in this case. And using this smart contract, what we can actually do is we can enforce that Bob behaves correctly if Alice writes transaction TX1 to Bitcoin, right? Because we can require Bob to lock in some coins in the contract, and the contract will then release these coins if Alice can show that she spent, uh, sent Bitcoin to Bob on the Bitcoin side. So this is actually a very weak model. Using H2C it becomes more complicated. In fact, we'll cover this in a few slides later on. Now, if Alice now writes transaction 1 to Bitcoin, she wants to be sure that she receives the coins in Ethereum. So what she has to do is she has, to, she has to submit a proof or somehow inform this smart contract on the Ethereum side 
that she actually wrote the transaction to the Bitcoin side. And the problem is, within a single chain, yes, this smart contract could actually verify, right? You could, if Alice were to write to Ethereum and to call a function of the smart contract, the contract would become aware that yes, something has happened. But since these are separate ledgers, this contract by itself, also being a program which reacts to some input, it has no other way to verify that something happened on Bitcoin, except if someone tells it that has happened. And this is actually where the intuition of the visibility comes in. Because the only way we can solve this problem is we can make an assumption that either all parties, that we have a synchronous model, that means Alice is also online, and that we know that there's a bound on the message delay. So basically, in this case, Alice is online, she is honest to herself, obviously, and she's an incentive to claim the coins on the Ethereum side after saying the Bitcoin. So she is the one who submits the proof. But the problem is, if we do not want to make this assumption in a synchronous model, and we want to allow Alice to crash, which is a typical assumption we have to make, the only other way we can achieve actual cross correct crossing communication is by having a trusted third party, which then takes the transaction one proof and submits it to the smart contract, or once you have a trusted third party, you might as well trust the third party to be the one who locks the coins on the, on the Ethereum side. Uh, Question? Uh, like a move, like a state between like a blockchains will allow to make this move. And if moving like a state is done like a, by some game which allows not to be just a trusted party by like a, some developing controller and like a protocol. So there's a certain I'm just trying still to understand yeah. what does it mean trust us in this way. So the trust so the trusted third party in the sense of distributed systems, we I mean obviously you want it to behave honestly, you make this assumption. But if you build a game around this trusted third party, it doesn't guarantee you that this party will behave honestly. Sure. It just incentivizes. It's a BFT like a protocol. Like exactly. So if you say this party must lock collateral and it will reimburse you, you may not face financial damage, but the protocol still failed. Right? You still, the actual. So trust it will be mean like a pure mathematical like a trust and not like a economically bound like a game. So, I'm not simply mathematical. Let's say, let's put it that way. Trustless in game theory is a grayish definition, right? I mean, essentially, if you and we have their protocols, which ensure that you don't face I mean, financial the whole damages. Is based on like that, like, so like, sure. But in all these protocols, you have some timeouts and some time locks and some synchrony assumptions. Because if you don't have a synchrony assumption, it breaks. We'll, we'll come to that in a bit. I mean, we'll, we'll discuss atomic swaps, cryptocurrency backed assets, and you'll see where the synchronous assumption comes in, actually. So your argument in this example was that Alice would not be able to do the transaction, and that's why you third party? So the thing is, in this model, we must allow Alice to crash, right? We cannot assume. Yes. If we assume that Alice is always a online... There's a amount of time within a hash time lock country in which she can... Bring we'll, we'll get to hash time lock countries in a second, and I'll actually okay. explain on an example why this still is a problem. But essentially, well, there is a problem, the option problem, but I mean... Uh, not, not exactly. And that's also a problem. But in HashML contracts, they only ensure that you cannot steal or misbehave within a certain period of time. But if you crash and the time it expires, it still fails. There's a specific example on this. And why don't we let him yeah. get through all the examples? Okay. Sorry. Question? Uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about how important it is for us to um, not rely on the synchrony assumption? And like why that's important and kind of... I mean, the thing is, so in, when we design protocols, often we make the assumption that we have a synchronous network model because it's way easier to design these things, right? We assume that if I send a message, at some point you will receive it. However, if we cannot make this assumption, then I do not know, and if we assume that nodes can be malicious, then I do not know if you're malicious or you just do not get the message. And there's a really famous FLP impossibility result by Nancy Lynch, which actually states, Consensus is impossible in a system where you have more than one, or at least one call to know if it's a synchronous. Because again, I send you the message, but if I cannot make an assumption, I don't know whether you received it or not. I don't know. Maybe you're malicious and you're just, you know, pretending not to know it, or the network actually has a huge delay. Usually, the synchrony is a network assumption and not yes. a participant assumption. It sounds like here it's an assumption regarding Alice. So I was just wondering. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Which one is it? In this case, I mean, it's both, because you need Alice to be online, because she needs to send the message. Sure, but you can usually ensure that somehow, but if the network, you don't have a synchrony assumption, then it's hard. The, yes, so the problem is within a single system, you, you can try to ensure that Alice sends the message or something. That's the timeless assumption, right? At some point, Alice will write the message. But here we kind of have two separate 
separate systems. So you have two separate networks. But yeah, I, I see the point. So the, the definitions are more clear in the paper, hopefully. It's just, it's not an easy thing to just explain by intuition. But I hope this kind of makes sense to everyone. Or are there any more questions on this? OK, so if you have questions, you'll, you'll just have to trust me. <laughs> So yeah, we conjecture that it's equivalent, and then there's a discussion in the 1999 impossibility result on why this is the case. And they try to give a, a similar explanation of why actually having a synchronous model is very similar to having a trusted third party, right? Because again, Alice, if she has to be online, and we must expect the message to be delivered on time, it's the same thing as if we had a trusted third party. So the trusted third party is online, and it ensures that messages deli are delivered on time, and it ensures that a protocol progresses. If we, have assumed, if we assume synchrony, Alice is her own third party. Or she trusts herself because she knows she'll be online and message will be delivered. So if you, it's basically it's the same thing, whether you assume a trusted third party or you assume a synchronous assumption, from theory perspective. Now obviously, assuming a trusted third party, the trusted third party could steal your coins and everything. But for the correct execution of the protocol, and again, this is where the game theoretic perspective comes in. If you can ensure that the trusted third party cannot defraud you financially, it still is the same thing as a synchronous assumption from distributed systems perspective. Now, Mustafa will take over the classification of protocols, and then we'll move on to the examples. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the different um, types of protocols that you use to, to do cross-chain communication. And this is based on a paper that um, we wrote, um, a systemization of knowledge paper that and compares different cross-chain communication protocols. Okay. Um, so, so obviously, as, as, as Alex said, there's different use cases for cross-chain protocols, side chains, sharding, so on and so forth, and we're going to go through them. So the first classification that we have is we basically separate all um, cross-chain communication protocols into two broad categories. Okay. The first category, um, so fire on, fire on forget, is basically uh, when you basically post a message on chain and there is no uh, recovery or board phase. Um, so what, we, what, do I, what do we mean by that is um, in, in some cases, um, if you are trying to swap an asset and you want that swap to be atomic, or, or you want that transaction to be atomic, in the sense that um, if you if you if you try to move X to chain Y, but um, if X cannot move, cannot successfully move to chain Y, there's two different ways of dealing with that. The first way is try and forget, where you basically pass a message on chain X, um, say chain X will now be moved to chain Y, and there's no recovery process behind that. So like there's no there's no way this can fail. If you say if you, if you say I want to check the chain X to chain Y, then then there's no kind of, then there's no abort phase or recovery process behind that. Um, but here uh, with two-phase commit protocols, um, there is an abort or recovery phase in the in the case where a transaction fails. Okay, so um, so you might. Um, uh, move, chain, move object X to, ch to chain Y, but you might realize. But uh, when you move uh, chain X, uh, object X to chain Y, uh, it might be the case that you might have to undo that because the, trans the overall transaction that this process is part of has failed. So, and this is where the abort comes in. Okay, and that will it will become more clear when we actually go through the actual protocols. But this, this is a classification. Uh, second classification is um, local and global verification. So when you actually do cross child communication or cross chain communication, um, who is responsible for verifying that communication? Um, for some um, protocols, use local verification, which is basically when only the, the participants who are involved in that cross-chain communication are responsible for verifying that cross-chain communication. For example, um, HTLC based atomic swaps. Um, so for example, if Alice wants to send some money to Bob, only Bob is responsible for verifying that that money has been sent. 
Now, on the other hand, with global verification, you don't just need the two participants or the participants of the cross-chain communication protocol to, ver to be involved in the verification. You also need the entire consensus to be involved um, with that verification, or you need to verify the consensus. Of the, you need to verify some consensus level um, header or, or object. And one example of this is um, atomic swaps with transaction inclusion proofs. So the transaction inclusion proof um, with some Bitcoin, for example, the Ethereum chain um, has to receive a block header from the Bitcoin chain, and the Ethereum chain has to verify the proof of work of that block header. And so that's global verification because the Ethereum chain is verifying the consensus of the Bitcoin chain. So the entire Ethereum chain is basically involved um, in some way um, of verifying the communication. And finally, um, the security model. Uh, there's different security models um, for um, cross-chain communication. There's homogeneous and heterogeneous. Um, heterogeneous, let's start with uh, heterogeneous, because that's more simple to understand. Um, heterogeneous is basically when you have different chains that aren't really kind of connected or directly connected to each other. For example, let's say you want to communicate with from Bitcoin to Ethereum, or any or any of these chains, this is considered heterogeneous because these chains um, are built differently and have different security assumptions. Okay, so you might not be able to necessarily make assumptions about the security of interlinked chains. Like I could just create my own blockchain and communicate with Bitcoin, for example, using atomic swap. But people in Bitcoin can't make assumptions about the security of my chain. Now, with homogeneous, um, with the homogeneous security model, it's there's a uniform level of security. For example, sharding. In, sh in sharded, in a sharded system, um, there's multiple chains, but those chains are part of the same system, and they use the same consensus protocol, and they they're designed to be connected to each other. So you can make assumptions about the security of those chains. And um, usually chartered systems are designed in such a way that if one chain fails, then so does the other, because th those chains rely on the state of if each other. Um, so it, you might be familiar with Cosmos, for example, or Polkadot. Um, Polkadot and Cosmos, for example, have a heterogeneous security model. Um, so, for example, in Cosmos or Polkadot, you can create your own zone or chain uh, with your own consensus. Where, for, for example, Ethereum 2.0 sharding or any sharding protocol is considered to be homogeneous. And so, we're going to go through the different protocols. Um, not, we're not going to go into them in too much detail, um, but uh, we're going to Take it to give it to Alexei to first start off with atomic swaps. Cool. So yeah. Um, also, just one thing on this on this figure. So I mean, we won't have time to go into detail about all of them. Um, but one thing that you may notice is that local verification. So when only two the participants who are involved in the exchange have to you know to, to do the checks, it's actually agnostic of the blockchain. So it's agnostic of the security model. Obviously, you need to make sure that the locking mechanism is available, but otherwise, you don't care about any consensus level details and so on. Because again, only us to are verified. So, let's talk about cross validation transfers, and I hope I'll be able to answer your question why HLCs may not solve your problems expected. So, again, in atomic swaps via symmetric use blocks. Sorry? Sorry? Can you use the microphone? Sure. So in atomic swaps using symmetric locks, the idea is that both parties, Alice and Bob, use the same locking condition on both chains. An example are hash locks, right? So what Alice creates, she generates a secret and creates a con spending condition on Bitcoin, for example, which says, if you, release, if you can provide me with a secret, you can take these coins. And Bob does the same thing. So usually they'll have a setup phase, they'll exchange verification transactions, and so on, but then they both know the hash of the secret. So Bob makes the same lock. Now in the next step, well, if Alice wants to spend Bob's coins, she has to reveal the secret, and this again ensures that Bob has a secret and can also take Alice's coins. Now, 
Typically, you also have time locks to prevent that if one of the parties crashes or if the exchange never starts, that your funds are not locked up indefinitely. But this bears a problem, and this is, I, I hope, because basically this is why HTLCs don't solve the problem or the cross chain communication problem, because what can happen is a Bob can crash, right? Alice spends the coins from Ethereum, believe, reveals a secret, but Bob never sees it because he's crashed. And what happens then is Alice can wait until the time that expires and take her coins back on the Bitcoin side. But that's why you choose the time walks like this. It doesn't matter. It does, it if doesn't Bob matter. crashes, no. Well, if Bob matter. crashes, before he, so look, Bob never ever even sees the secret. He's just offline. He posted the lock and he crashed. Well, and the secret is still there. You just have to find it. It's, everything is public. No, no, but look, Bob, the guy who could spend these coins, because this is not just the hash lock, it's hash lock and the Bob signature on the Bitcoin side, right? This can only be spent by Alice, this can only be spent by Bob, right? Mm, well, so that's how you should construct it. And if Bob crashes and he never sees the secret, and he does not come online before the time lock of this thing expires, Alice can withdraw because sure, that's, that's... That's why you choose time locks in a way like this, so he has enough time to still do it. <laughs> okay, you're con it's not a contradiction. Yes, you do. The, you choose the time locks, but if he's offline, no matter, indefinitely, he crashes. Well, if he well, if he's offline indefinitely, of course, but then he cannot, he shouldn't participate on blockchain solutions. Anymore. Okay, yeah, well, let's take this offline, but that's an impossibility. So. <laughs> to both degree. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's assumption. What if Bob dies? Ah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's bad, but it's it's still impossible with, uh, without anyone enforcing that he stays online. That's the result. I don't say that you should participate in the exchange if you think you may crash. That's where you can always watch stars, but still. Now, what you can also do is you can try to say, well, what if Bob is, we can make sure that Bob actually is online the whole time. And he can actually go offline because he uses a smart contract. And that's the same example as we show using the visibility result. So Bob locks his coin, locks, locks his coins in the smart contract and says, okay, well, if you can prove to this contract or anyone that you send Bitcoin to my account on the Bitcoin side, you can take these coins. And now the responsibility is on Alice because she is the one who has to push the coins to Bitcoin, and oh, sorry, send the coins on Bitcoin and push the proof. The problem is, so Bob can go offline, but what if Alice crashes? So Alice sends the Bitcoin and then she goes offline. And of course Bob could say, well, okay, I'm a nice guy, I'll give you, I'll, I'll send the proof myself, or anyone else could do it. So it's already an improvement because now anyone can push the proof and the contract will give you the coins. But it's again, if you think about it, it's the same thing as with HTLCs. And furthermore, if this time of expires again, Bob can take the coins out. So if, if Alice crashes and she's offline, or Bob is the guy who actually has a, runs a denial service attack against Alice, he can actually steal coins. So another approach, and this is basically some, a different approach to cross-chain communication, is to use cryptocurrency-backed assets. So instead of trying to circumvent this impossibility result each time we exchange, what we can do is we can create a representation of Bitcoin on Ethereum. And we have a whole paper describing this concept, a term to explain, and I'll try to give a very, very brief overview. So what you do is you send coins to a vault, which is collateralized and insured through in an Ethereum smart contract. So you have to give through it to guarantee that if, if nothing goes wrong, so if something goes wrong, you'll get reimbursed. In this case, in Ethereum, so you still have to meet the exchange rates. Now, Alice then submits a proof to the contract that she locked up the coins and receives Bitcoin back tokens. And she can use these tokens to now make native atomic swaps with better guarantees and it can optimize more. We still have the impossibility result of fair exchange, also the free option problem, but at least we don't have to synchronize clocks and everything else across two chains. And we also don't have to trust that at this point in time there is no attack on Bitcoin which prevents transactions being included. So you do the, you do the slow setup and costly setup phase once, and then you can trade these tokens and use them as smart contracts. Sorry, what's the options problem? Um, I say I'll, we don't Sorry, have that much okay, time, okay. but it's it's a fairness problem that I can cancel the exchange and basically get a free option because I know what your offer is, but you don't know what my oh, offer okay, is. Gotcha. So now when I want to go back, I burn these coins and then the vault has to release these coins to me. Otherwise, it will get slashed, and to get the collateral back, it submits a proof. I'm skipping over this because we're running out of time, but there's a whole paper describing this concept, and we also have some code online. So a yeah. vault is a smart contract, or is it a vault? No. So the vault. So this thing was constructed in a way that you need smart contracts only in one chain. A vault can be a smart contract or a participant, and can be a human on the Bitcoin side. You just need smart contracts on the side where you issue the tokens. Is so that the vault of the party? Sorry? Is that the vault a trusted party? As well? It's a trusted party from distributed systems perspective for liveness. 
but from financial perspective, it's, it's insured with collateral. So if it fails, I can get back collateral from the Ethereum side. So, I, so the construction is, if the exchange rates don't crash completely, I as a participant do not face financial damage. Can we just go fly through this from user to water? That's a different thing. The vault can go offline, but then the contract, I can, if I'm online, and I can go to the contract and say, wait a second, this guy went offline. But then I have to be online to accuse him, right? I have to then say, well, he didn't do it. Or in our case, actually, if the vault does not submit the proof on time, I'm automatically reimbursed. But if you think about it, the, the communication actually failed because nothing happened on the Bitcoin side, right? I didn't actually trigger a process on the Bitcoin side. I just got reimbursed on the Ethereum side. So cross-chain communication failed, but I still, because the protocol is constructed that way, I got a reimbursement on the one chain that I'm on. So there's two different aspects of this. You have to be careful to separate them. Cool, now back to Mustafa and Charlie. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a brief overview of uh, cross-shard communications. Okay, so um, this is, so I'm gonna rehash the atomic transaction problem. So what is the uh, atomic transaction problem? It's also, it can also be called the train and result problem. So let's suppose Alice wants to book a, tri a, tri a trip and she needs a hotel room and a train seat to get to the hotel. And let's suppose that there's a travel agent contract on the chain. And what that contract basically does, it books, it books a hotel room and a train seat at the same time. Just like when you go to Expedia, you can book a package with your flight and hotel at the same time. Now, let's suppose that the hotel room object or contract is in shard one, and the train seat is in shard two. So that means the travel agent contract will have to communicate with both shards to execute this transaction where Alice wants to uh, book a a hotel room and a train seat at the same time, okay? But the key thing here is that Alice wants to book both the hotel room and the train seat. We don't want to end up in a situation where one of those transactions failed, because if the, the train seat transaction fails, then Alice has a hotel room but nowhere to get to it. Or if the hotel fails, then the, she has a train seat but no place to stay. Now, so let's suppose this transaction happens, she, tr she tries to make this transaction, but let's suppose in the last second, Bob comes along and tries to book the same hotel room one second earlier, right? But Alice has already submitted this transaction or submits it one, one second later. Can end up in a situation where Bob ends up with the hotel room and uh, Alice has a train seat, but she has failed to book the hotel room. So her transaction, so the transaction wasn't atomic. Okay, now uh, the goal of cross-shard communication is to have atomic transactions. So that it should be that either Alice gets the, both the hotel room and the train seat, or nothing. It's all or nothing. We don't want a, we don't want a half complete transaction. So there's, there's two kind of broad categories of doing cross-shard communication. Uh, the first one uh, cross is, is basically uh, mutex based. Um, Vitalik uh, made a blog uh, post about this on Ethereum research. He called it cross shard yanking, but it's actually basically mutexes, which was invented in the 70s. And um, the idea is very simple. Um, so basically, what you do is you issue a yank command for the for the hotel room, and what that does is it removes that hotel room from that shard, and that shard generates a receipt that this has happened, that the hotel room has been removed from this shard. And that receipt is simply a message in the block. And the receipt itself is basic, um, can be proven using a Merkle proof. And then what Alice does is she sends that receipt to you. And that um, shard 2 reads this receipt and recreates this hotel room in that shard. And so, and so now the hotel room and the train seat are now in the same shard, and so now there's no, no cross shard communication is ne even needed. You can, you can, the transaction can all happen in the same shard. So now, yeah. 
So, yeah, so what I just described was a fire and forget protocol. So this was a, um, here, it's a fire and forget protocol. There's no recovery phase, there's no abort phase, right? There's no way that, there's, not, there's no failure mode here. The only potential failure mode here is if, um, when, during the time that Alice um, moved this hotel room to this shard, Bob might move this train seat to, the, to shard one. So then she has to move hotel, the hotel room back to uh, shard one. But in terms of the actual protocol, the, the protocol itself does not have a built-in support or recovery phase. Now, the other uh, mechanism for doing cross-shot communication is called two-phase commit. And uh, don't, don't be too as well overwhelmed by this diagram. I'll explain it. Um, two-phase commit is a very old protocol, uh, decades old. Uh, it's, it was used in distributed systems design. But it can also be applied to sharding. Uh, it's called two-phase commit because there's two phases. Okay, So let's suppose you have shard one and shard two. Shard one manages the hotel. Shard two manages the train. Um, the user sends the transaction to both shards. And then what the shards do is um, they um, check that the transaction is valid using Byzantine, and, and they run a Byzantine folklore protocol on it, just like, you know, bit, just like basically what blockchain is, um, to uh, agree that the transaction, on, on, tra on the ordering of the transaction, or the, trans or, the trans or that the transaction has taken place, and then they lock, they lock these objects, okay? So that means that once these objects are locked, no other transaction can come along and try to use these objects. Because this this object, these objects will be locked to this transaction. So it's like this transaction is reserving, reserving these objects. It's just like when you go on event right, for example, and you try you book a ticket, it says this ticket has been reserved for seven minutes or something like that. If you do, if you don't book it within seven minutes, then you will lose lose your ticket. Exactly the same principle. You're basically reserving these objects for this transaction. And then once both of these, once all of the shards have locked all of the objects necessary that's needed for this transaction, um, they basically um, communicate with each other to tell them that, yes, this, these objects have been locked to this transaction. And then they can execute this transaction and unlock the objects. Or specifically, actually, just destroy the objects, uh, depending on how, depending on your transaction model. If it's, if it's a UTXO model, you will destroy the object because UTXO is only spent one, once. If it's a contract model, then it's basically unlocked. And so that's basically the, the principle. Now, what could happen is if, um, if another transaction, I have a diagram for this, but if another transaction, if, if Bob comes along and tries to reserve the same hotel, this locking will this locking will fail. And then both of the objects will be unlocked, but the transaction will be aborted. The transaction won't be committed, it will be aborted. Okay, so now we're going to talk quickly about cross chain verification. I'm going to pass that Okay, so yeah, just do that up. Okay, quickly talk about cross chain verification validation, and this I think will go into the demo that we're going to the workshop. Uh, actually, how many, how many people actually have a laptop here? And can participate in the coding part. Can you can you raise like just so we see? So you have to, okay, cool. Yeah, then we'll okay. that's like another 10-15 minutes and then we switch to the okay. Okay. So yeah, let's just go through this. Okay. Yeah, just okay, so cross chain verification and validation. Um, when you do cross chain transactions, you need to validate that the messages that you're receiving cross chain are actually valid and verified. Now, there's different levels of verification for a blockchain, okay? And specifically with cross-chain cross -chain communication. Uh, first level, uh, st state verification. Like, I don't mean verifying that the state is correct, I mean just verifying what the state is, or what, or what, or what the consensus thinks the state is. For example, checking that some, the, some block header, sorry? State is just proof of work, right? Yeah, that's what I meant. It's okay. just not it's checking, but it's not checking the state is valid. It's checking what uh, does the consensus? What what uh, what uh, state does the consensus uh, agree, uh, agree on? Like what 
like so it's just taking the proof of work. So if you have a a, hack, a Merkle root or a Merkle, sorry, a block header, then this simply involves checking that that block header has a proof of work on it or has has a correct has consensus. So does the state have consensus? Well, actually, maybe that's number two. Sorry, maybe I'm stuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe that number two is does it say it's consensus? Um, so step number one is just saying, simply checking that uh, the hash of the block has consensus. Number two is, check, is checking if the con if, this, if the consensus agrees on what the state is. Okay. So this is simply uh, like clients, so that or SPV SPV verification. So one you download a um, mobile wallet for Bitcoin, for example, on Andro uh, Android. That mobile wallet is only downloading a small piece of the block called the block header and it's not, it's not actually checking what the state is, it's just checking that the state has consensus. Um, and the third level is checking what transactions are included in the state that are relevant to you. So not, not necessarily every transaction. So for example, um, you might want someone you might want to check that someone sent you a transaction. So you would ask a node to give you a proof that that transaction has been included in the block. Simple medical proof. And um, number four is state validity. So just because you know that the state has consensus does not mean that the state is valid. Okay, so it's very possible that a dishonest majority of miners or stakers could produce a block that is invalid. Or even like a single miner could do that. Actually, not not even a size majority. Um, so, in the Bitcoin protocol or Ethereum protocol, um, for a block to be valid, it's not. It's a common misconception actually that a lot of people think for a block to be valid, it needs to have. It needs. It all needs to have its consensus. But that's not true. Not only does it need to have consensus, the actual the actual transactions in the block have to be correct as well. So. A dishonest majority of consensus participants should not be able to insert balance transactions into the block that steal people's money. So that's why it's also important to actually validate the state and not just trust the consensus. And that's basically the purpose of full nodes. If you run a full node, you're verifying the entire blockchain. You're, you're checking every single transaction. You're not just simply trust. You're not just simply trusting the consensus. And. Um, the fifth level, which we're not going to talk about, is data availability, um, which is basically um, checking, I guess that's kind of coupled with checking validity, it's checking that um, if all of the block data is actually available <coughs> for the verification. And uh, this can be actually done as an alternative to state validity. Instead of checking, instead of checking that the state is correct yourself, you just assume that the state is correct and rely on something called fraud proofs um, to tell to, that, that other people can generate if the state is incorrect so that they can prove to you that the state is incorrect. So um, normally blockchains use a, like a guilty and mental proof and innocent model where you, you assume that every block is, is incorrect and so you prove otherwise. Whereas with fraud proofs you use an innocent but proven guilty uh, model But we're not going to be talking about data availability. And uh, yeah, the green stuff is basically what light clients and SDV clients do, which will be relevant to the, the workshop. And uh, um, yeah, other there's other verification techniques. So as I said, direct observation. You run a full node yourself to check the to check the validity of the chain. Um, Watchtower. So you can like ask ask someone to run a full node on your behalf. As a fallback, if you fail, and like this, there's certain ways to do this that's not, that does not require trusting that watchtower. Um, that I'm not gonna, that we're not going to go into detail, or just simply a coordinator, just to fully trust someone. <coughs> or there's um, verification games. So what some protocols like Truebit do is the computation happens off chain, um, but if if um, the execution is correct. Can challenge the execution result on chain, and there's like an interactive game that is played to challenge the, 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 the verification result. And um, basically, the person who submitted that interactive result will lose some money. Okay. 
Cool. So we'll do a really quick technical deep dive into chain relays, which is relevant for the practical part. And then since not everyone has a laptop, I suggest we split the room. So one room can do the coding example. We'll also provide this online afterwards. So we have to prep the server and everything, and we'll have a UI, and you can play the game later on. So we'll make it available. And then in the other side, if you have any more questions you want to discuss, we can continue. Okay? So, but let's do another five minutes because that's kind of relevant for everyone, even if you're not participating in the game. So, as mentioned, chain relays are basically SPV clients, right? So they allow us to verify the state, the state agreement, and state evolution of another blockchain. Now, state can also be considered just parsing some transactional data, right? You just know, well, you can parse the data of a Bitcoin transaction, but you have no clue where it's actually included or even, yeah, existed. Now, the thing is, when SPV clients, and that's a kind of a problem because it's not really being defined in practice. I mean, you have a lot of formal frameworks for this now, the backbone model, but I have not really seen a, a lot of clear definitions of what an SPV client should do. I mean, basically everyone knows, but then we don't really write it down. But if we build an SPV client, that's when we actually start to think about it. So what do we need to verify? And the first thing is we need to be aware of the difficulty just because otherwise, since we know that in Bitcoin the difficulty is switched every 2060 blocks and Ethereum is different, but we need to make sure that our chain relay program knows what the difficulty is expected at this point in time. Otherwise, I could submit blocks which are too easy. Next, we have to verify the proof of work. That's clear. We have to check that each block that we submit is an ancestor, right? Because we want to make sure it's a chain. Then we also have to make sure we can detect forks, right? We need to know if we have two chains, which one is the main chain, which is the shorter one. And finally, we also want to make sure that we can check transaction inclusion proofs, because that's the actual thing that you want to achieve when you do SPV client. You want to know if a transaction existed or occurred. Now, in our game today, we've simplified the implementation. We've dropped the difficulty adjustment verification, and we've removed for count. Otherwise, the code base becomes too big. So we assume that we have constant difficulty and we have no forks, right? It's a simple model. And yeah, we were at the test net, so you won't be able to break things. So, a question that people often ask is, well, what, what happens in proof-of-stake blockchains, right? Because it seems similar, but then there's a, there's a, there's a subtle difference in this. Because instead of checking and tracking the proof-of-work difficulty adjustment, you need to track the stake distribution of the chain, because <coughs> you need to know who is allowed to sign in each round, right? In proof-of-work, you know the guy who found the proof-of-work and that the proof-of-work match difficulty target, he's the one. In proof-of-stake, you may even have a committee, but you need to know, like, are they the ones who are um, allowed to sign this round? And then you check signatures, which is usually way efficient than verified proof of work. At least if you have to do it cross chain. And the rest basically stays the same. Now, practical challenges that we face when implementing this. Obviously, we need to make sure that we have the cryptographic primitives there. So we need to be able to verify the proof of work of the chain we're checking. Right? So this works for Bitcoin and Ethereum, but if you try to do the same thing for Litecoin, you run into major problems. So it costs around 100 blocks of worth of Ethereum gas to verify a single Litecoin block. So that doesn't really work. And then you must make sure that your chain relay is alive, right? It's a single SPV client deployed in the chain, and if no one provides the data, well, then it's not really usable. And the problem is we know that it costs us money to submit the blocks to the chain relay in theory. You have to pay the gas costs. So if you come along to the BDC relay, and the last time we checked it was around 90,000 blocks per the Bitcoin main chain. So if I don't want to use the original chain relay deployment, Ah, it's not really feasible. So your best goal is to redeploy it, agree with your parties that you have a new block that you're aware of, and then you start submitting again. Or one day maybe we'll have more efficient light clients that use fly client or super block repo powers. We have a discussion in the paper and we point to the links. I won't go into detail because, like, yeah. So we, we actually, we looked at the BDC that was deployed originally, and what we see here is that there is kind of a discrepancy between the time that the Bitcoin block was generated and when it, arise, when it arrived in the Ethereum blockchain, in the chain relay. And if we take a closer look, I mean, we see that a lot of blocks were delayed around 3,000 hours, which is not really practical. I mean, you'd expect six hours to be delayed, or maybe 10, right, because we wait for confirmations. But then someone should push it. So the problem, are, the problem is incentives, right? Someone has to pay for this. And what we also saw that only two addresses submitted more than 90% of the blocks. So I mean, essentially this was consensus running the video serial. But in practice, we, if, if you have an application, you need to make sure you separate, split the fees among participants. Otherwise, you may have incentive problems. And if the chain is not up to date, it's not usable. And you run into the problem that you can't submit the proofs. And yeah, unfortunately, it seems dead. So the original video serial <coughs> implementation is not longer running. 
There is new implementations by Suma, so they have a nice library. We've also done a lot of implementations. So in theory, you can redeploy it if you need to use it, but the original one is unfortunately dead, it seems. So yeah, and finally, the cost factor, right? So we need to pay for submitting the blocks, and what we need to do is we need to pay for each block that we push to the BDC relay. I mean, the, the cost thing is the same for SPV clients, except that if, you, if it's your phone, you can then delete the, the, the blocks, right, if you don't need them anymore. And the costing model is different. Storage is not that expensive on your mobile phone, but it is very expensive if you have a contract storage thing. So what you can do then is you can try to improve, improve this using uh, sublinear-like client techniques, but this requires changes to the actual blockchain you're verifying. So both fly client and super block nipple clause, which I would have described on the, discussed on this slide, but we don't have time. But they basically allow you to only submit a logarithmic amount of blocks instead of linear. But yeah, um, another maybe practical challenge is that if we want to deploy this on many chains, what we end up doing is we submit block headers from n chains that we want to verify to n chains that we're verifying on. So it doesn't it seems a bit kind of a problem, right? So in the long, in the long term, we probably want to find out how we can reduce this and maybe share data across multiple chains. So yeah, we don't cover everything, and being academics, we just say, please read our paper for everything else. We discuss locking techniques, how to achieve atomicity, HDLCs, ECDSA locks, and so on. We also talk about the implications for privacy, security, and the network threat models. So when you design blockchain across your communication protocols, these are the things you must consider. So yeah, and now to the practical part. Are you gonna post these slides anymore? Um, we will release them at some point. 